Well, before we have Sister Joan come out and we have our keynote, uh, there's several of us that are licensed administrators, and my understanding is we had some problems with our, uh, our badges this morning. Uh, so I, I've been informed and notified that uh, we have new badges. And the, those of you that have an administrator's license, it was scanned in this morning already. Uh, so folks will be coming around giving you new badges so that for the rest of the conference, uh, you'll be able to get your CEUs. Clearly, without intelligent hearers, as well as speakers, without those who ask questions, as well as those whose role it is to preserve old answers, the most vital of traditions is in danger. But there is another way to keep tradition itself and to keep it alive. Born in Dubois, Pennsylvania, Sister Joan says she felt called to be a nun at just three years old after the death of her father. And then do something. Do go where your defining moments lead you. The generation who recognizes that what this generation is doing is dead wood. An award-winning author of nearly 50 books, she brings her passion, her energy, and fiery spirit to everything she does. Uh, the Rule of Benedict, written in the sixth century, in chapter seven on humility, says that the first the first degree of humility is to be aware of the presence of God in you. It's not a merit theology. You don't buy God. You don't coax God. You don't persuade God. You don't captive God. You don't put salt on God's tail. Like they told you when you were a little kid, you could catch a bird. Put, put salt in the bird's tail, you could catch God. We spend our lives trying to catch God. Where is God? Right here. As she grew in faith, she also grew in the courage of her convictions. The devout Catholic nun with a modern mind, she speaks out about the role women play in our global culture. Of the three great virtues, faith, hope, and love, hope is greatest. Faith only tells us that God is, and love only tells us that God is good. But hope tells us that God will work God's will in the scriptures where for the monastic God and I are a constant conversation. It is hope that enables us to continue the climb. We are holding hands together, not to weaken anybody else's tradition. You've got to allow people to color outside the lines or you'll never get the big picture, ever. So when I get up in the morning, I always have a goal. I think purpose is the definition of the life well lived. Wisdom and Moxie have taken her far beyond the monastery walls. She writes, lectures, travels the world, spreading a universal message of peace, justice, and equality. Then Augusta writes, and Hope has two lovely daughters. I didn't write that. He wrote that. Hope has two lovely daughters, anger and courage anger so that what must not be may not be, and courage so that my, what must be will be. Please, we leave you with, begging you, as you go out the door, go out with a touch of anger and a burst of courage, and it's coming. Please give a warm BHS welcome to Sister Joan Chittister. Oh, things like that scare me to death. Uh, um, I, I should tell you that we tell, we tell a story back home in Pennsylvania that <clears throat> gets me through those kinds of, of, uh, of introductions. This thing's trying to kill me. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, we tell a story about a priest and a rabbi who went to a prize fight together. And when a little Jewish kid came out, he jumped up and down on the stage. He, he beat his chest and he went to his corner. Then a little Catholic boy came out. He jumped up and down, he beat on his chest, he uh, made the sign of the cross and went to his corner. The priest, uh, the rabbi looked at the priest and he said, is that gonna help him? 
and the priest said, only if he can fight. <laughs> I understand. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is, is not, not necessarily what I did in the past, but what I think you as a particular group uh, may be touching uh, uh, yourselves, but which I would like to help you define so that you understand what it is that, that you as a group are doing consciously that uh, many other groups may be doing well, but not as spiritually conscious as this. So um, I, I want, I'm going to tell you uh, uh, one more story about uh, Bert and Ethel. And Bert and Ethel are back in Pennsylvania someplace, too. And, and they're getting up there, you know, early 70s, mid-70s, something like that. And they begin to understand that they're, uh, they're slipping, you know. Where, where are the car keys? What day is this? Uh, when will you be home tonight? So they decided that they would begin to write things down to help one another remember so that it, it wasn't embarrassing, it wasn't difficult. So uh, uh, one night they were watching television and Bert said to Ethel, I'm gonna go out and get something in the kitchen. You want anything? She said, yeah, I do. She said, I want a dish of vanilla ice cream. Write it down. He said, I can remember vanilla ice cream. She said, yeah, maybe, but I want chocolate syrup on it too. Write it down. He said, Ethel, I don't want to get silly about this thing. You know, when, when things are important, we can do it. But when it's, it's small, I, I don't want to be extreme. She said, but I want a cherry on it too, and I want you to write it down. He said, oh, for God's sake, and he left the room. He was gone quite a while. She heard the kitchen cupboard doors slamming. She heard the pots and pans rattling. About 20 minutes later, he came in carrying a big silver platter of bacon and eggs. <laughs> she looked up at him and she said, I told you to write it down. I knew you'd forget the toast. <laughs> it's a question for us. The question is, what has been written down for us as a group, as a people, as a mindset that we ourselves are forgetting or maybe we've never really known it? So with that in mind, let's look at three other approaches to this subject. The first is from Abazosimus, a fifth century desert monastic who wrote, it is well said by a wise person that the soul has many masters as it has passions and people are slaves to whatever masters them. I want to deal today then with what it takes to recognize what is mastering us, and then discover what it will take to enable each of us to break our own chains and the chains of the institutions around us. The second is about a Sufi who was found on the way to the mosque, down on his knees, searching frantically in the sand, wailing, crying for help. And many pilgrims, all of them good people, stopped to help him. Finally, after hours of fruitless search in the noonday sun, one of the pilgrims said, Sufi, are you sure you lost your treasure here? And the Sufi said, no, I didn't lose my treasure here. I lost my treasure over there on the other side of the mountains. But Sufi, the pilgrim said, if you know that you didn't lose your treasure here. What? Why, in the name of Allah, are you looking for it here? And the Sufi said, I'm looking for it here because there's more light here. We need to ask ourselves where we should be looking at this time in order to shine a better light on what we're doing and where we need to go to find again the values and the valuables that we are now losing. The third insight that drives this reflection is from Joseph Conrad who writes, the question is not how to get cured. The question is how to live. Or to put it another way, there is as much need, dear friends, to cure the soul, to heal the heart, as there ever will be to mend the body. I came out here as a Benedictine to be with you, to remind you that Benedictinism is the most ancient monastic tradition in the church, 
and to talk to healers, all of you, in all of your capacities as medics, leaders, administrators, nurses, about the stress that underlies your patients' illnesses, but also about the stress that you yourselves are bearing as you deal with serving them. At the center of the Rule of Benedict, in chapter seven, the longest chapter, incidentally, in this very tiny rule, is embedded not a set of, of rules. What is embedded is a way of living, a way of life. What is embedded is a spirituality of relationships designed to bring peace of heart, calm of soul, and freedom from stress for all of us. And God knows we have never needed it more in this country than we do in the here and now. Our world, the United States, is tilting and turning in ways we never even thought possible. The headlines in our daily papers are a cacophony of rage and violence, of control and power plays, of personal insult and personal dishonesty. Whatever happened to the heart of this country? Every major institution in society now, marriage, government, education, medicine, work, even the churches are in a state of turmoil, of breakdown, of division and decline. And each of us, all of us together, are exhausted right now, looking for a cure for a deep-seated public depression and high-level tension. We need to ask ourselves where we can find a light to help us wend our way beyond the times of clear consensus that seem to be behind us now and through this time of contradictory values. We're at a defining moment, it seems. The United States no longer even lays claim to being the leader of the free world. Now, instead, we're more committed to a national policy of America first. America first, free of concern in a global world of the interests or equality of others. No, now we want only to win, win, win until we're sick of winning. Now we want to stratify society by using race, ethnicity, and color as a measurement of our welcome to people. We want to recommit ourselves to pioneer values of rugged individualism, which translated means ruthless, unregulated competition, rather than compassion and communal responsibility. We want, it seems, to forsake the soul of a country once the beacon of the world in its search for freedom and justice for all. It's at best a shocking revisioning of national values. This was the country that in the course of a war designed to save the world from fascism, rebuilt the very countries to which it had done devastating destruction. This was the country that led the international war crimes trials and forged the notion that individual conscience superseded even official orders to evil. And yet this same country is now having to choose between facts and alternative facts, as if there is any such thing, between news and fake news, as if a commitment to truth the very essence of journalism was even debatable. And its women have been left to work under the shadow of a rape culture for the privilege of simply being allowed to work at all. How could such an erosion of ideals have come to pass so quickly, so completely, so opposed to both conscience and character? But the fact is that this torturous twist of American ideals has been in process for generations. We should have seen it coming. The history of ideas is a clear one. The Enlightenment movement of the 18th century 
with its emphasis on human reason as the primary source of authority, undermined both the divine right of kings and the absolutism of church law. Now that was surely a good thing, but it was also a dangerous one. And that enlightenment swept Europe. Six major countries were affected by it. France, Germany, England, Russia, Italy, and the newly minted United States. But each of them absorbed it in somewhat different ways. What was the American response? It was the Constitution of the United States and its emphasis on individual rights and democratic participation. Immanuel Kant's essay in 1784 entitled, What is the Enlightenment? put in one searing sentence the essence of that movement when he wrote, dare to know. Have courage to use your own reason. And with that, the glorification of rationality began. And all the old absolutes disappeared. This revolt against medieval philosophy generated whole new areas of speculation untethered from religion. Elements in the laboratory and galaxies in space made even the concept of God uncertain, if not actually suspect. There was no unity of faith or no unity of belief left. There was no common commitment to just about anything, everything. Everything was up for grabs now. A world fresh from this new focus on the Enlightenment and the achievements of science found itself with very little to worship, except, of course, itself. And so the time was right. Now, for the first time in history, self became the focus of philosophical thought. Descartes' dictum, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Not I feel, therefore I am. Not I aspire, therefore I am. And not I believe, therefore I am. But I think, therefore I am, became the battle cry of intellectualism and liberation from absolute authority everywhere. Old philosophical questions that had been the very bedrock of discussion since Plato, like beauty, like goodness, like pleasure, or pain, like the immortality of the soul, gave way to almost total concentration on the concept of the self. By the early 19th century, the philosopher Hegel defined self as the life and death struggle with the other. He argued, in other words, that the self is, quote, will and power in contest with the will to power in others. The individual at every table here is a, a, a demonstration of will and power in contest with the others at that table. All individual. That, he said, is, is what makes us great. And so the eternal war for personal preeminence began. The way was laid now for the kind of individual autonomy that communitarian society in Europe, for instance, had never known, never imagined, but which we grew up without. Self had become the center of the universe. And to confirm it, modern psychology, which incidentally was a very new invention in the 19th century, became a kind of outgrowth of this new interest in what it was to be human. So these new psychologists began to measure and survey and reduce the human person to experimental studies to the same degree and in the same manner 
as inert matter had now become the subject of the scientific method. From there, the slide to individualism and self-centeredness, to human development theories and personal growth institutes, to personal achievement and individual control models, and so to the self's shadow, narcissism. The need to be first, to be the greatest, to be unequaled, both personally and nationally, now followed swift and sure. Then me first and my money, conspicuous consumption, and a minimum wage for the rest of them, rather than a living wage for all of us, became the norm. So those who could get it, those who could get it themselves got it. And those who couldn't, didn't. And so what? Then Marie Antoinette's purported brutish response to the complaints of starving French peasants, well, if they don't have bread, let them eat cake, became in our day the cry to worthiness we're not going to support loafers and welfare queens, what we call the hungry and the needy of our time. Let them get a job, we say. No matter <clears throat> that there aren't any jobs for which these people can qualify, those people, these people, the uneducated, the mentally disabled, the physically disabled, the unskilled, and so what? And our budget reforms threaten the social safety net that provide health insurance, education, food stamps, child care, and old age pensions. I don't have to tell people like you and where you come from that. They took them away from those without the means to get those things for themselves. Then, now, America becomes a plutocracy, meaning ruled by the wealthy. And we celebrate the new individualism by reducing the working class to work without benefits. And we forget all that nice talk about equal opportunity. Like Marie Antoinette, we forget that the public aid that is given to maintain needy individuals in decency, dignity, and delight in life also serves to maintain the higher quality of the entire society as well. It allows average people to put trees on its streets and flowers in its yard, to paint its houses, to buy cars that will get them to work and have enough money left over after the bills are paid to feel like a human being. Without it, eventually, we will all suffer in the end and our property values with them. But more change than simply, than simply the economic strata in the nation, it changes us too. It changes our attitudes toward others and our attitudes toward others that we meet in our cubicles, in our offices, begins to deteriorate as our sense of self blooms. No, we don't do that. You'll have to get that somewhere else. And suddenly pride, pathological pride, masters us as a people. And we start to believe our own press. We really think we are the best and the brightest despite the fact that the 2017 Pew Research data on global, global student rankings indicates that the United States has dropped to 24th place in science, 24th place in reading, and 38th place in math. And the United States itself has slid from third place to 19th place in the world happiness quotient. But we float right along, smugly tone deaf, to our own slide down those ranks from a country once considered outstanding and then average. 
and now irrelevant as far as much of the rest of the world is now concerned. And so in 1968, for the first time in clinical history, psychiatrists identified the narcissistic personality and its grandiosity, its limitless need for attention, its lack of empathy for others, its aggressive, pushy personality style, and its relationship dysfunction as a personality disorder. Suddenly, Hegel's warning that the self is simply a will to power in contest with someone else's will to power became the nature of modern society. Look around you. Kim Jong-un wants his own nuclear weapon. Amazon wants to own every store in the country. Russia wants to be indomitable in a new Soviet Union. Xi Jinping in China wants unlimited power. And the United States ignores international negotiations to satisfy its own agenda, regardless of the effect of that on other nations of innocent people. Indeed, the self reigns everywhere now. Community, the hope of humankind, the very nature of life is becoming more fragile, more, more divided, more split by the day. Then the real question becomes, is there any way out of this state of things now that self is the center and the single definer of life? Is there any cure? Is there any way to heal this? And so where can we go for the model? What is the antidote to self-centeredness gone wild? Because society is now abandoned to the survival of the fittest, and its vision is reduced to the last billionaire or the last bully left standing. The truth is the corrosion of the human spirit has happened before. And it found its antidote in 6th century Rome. It's called the spirituality of humility. The spirituality, in other words, of our relationships. And historians through the ages tell us over and over again that that way of life saved Western civilization. In the 6th century, Benedict from Norcia founded what we now call Benedictinism. It is the oldest institution in the church other than the institutional church itself. And Benedict was a student in Rome that was then the center of that empire. Rome was the New York, the LA, the San Fran, the Chicago of its time, with all the glitz and glamor that implied in a society surfeited on excess, but deteriorating from the inside out. Rome, the narcissistic power of that time, had overreached its prideful power. It had overspent its resources on foreign legions that trumpeted its militarism over the known world, yes, but ironically, that militarism weakened its foreign influence. It bled its financial resources, and it debased its internal character. More, Rome had overlooked. No, not true, not true, John. Rome didn't overlook. Rome ignored the immigrants on its border who were waiting up there in big numbers, just waiting to pour through the perimeters of the Roman Empire like a sieve, not to destroy the empire. They weren't coming, the, Goth, the, the Goths and the Visigoths and the Vandals. They weren't coming to destroy anything. They were coming to share in the bounty that Rome had hoarded for itself. But Rome resisted those foreigners, those immigrants, and Rome the invincible. Rome, the very city itself, was sacked. 
was overwhelmed. Its glory days over, its global leadership defunct. As in the book of Daniel, remember, the handwriting was on the wall, but few, if anyone, could read it. In our own world, too, the headlines in our newspapers are signaling, trumpeting our withdrawal from the global community and our disdain for the rest of the global population. And few, if any, appear to understand the coming effect of that either. But in the sixth century, one person, <clears throat> this one young man, left Rome and its race to moral collapse and the norms of personal selfishness that went with its narcissism. But when he left, he left resolving to change the system, not by confronting it, not by competing with it to be bigger, better, more arrogant than it was, but by eroding its incredible credibility. As Blaise Pascal would later write, it is true that force rules the world, but opinion loses force. This one single young lay person simply decided to change people's opinions about what life had to be by himself living otherwise and refusing to accept the debauched social and moral standards around him. And how did he do it? By creating a new lifestyle within a lifestyle a new medical system within the bigger medical system, maybe, by forming people into communities of ideas that changed the way people thought and lived in that society. He wrote this little rule for life that would eliminate destitution where his new groups were by seeing that everyone had enough of what they needed, by seeing that these new groups of his were devoted to the sharing of goods as he was, by seeing that they were as conscious of care for the earth as he was, by seeing that they would teach and model a new perspective on community and human development as he did, and so in chapter 7 of his rule, right in the middle of this little book, he outlines his spirituality of relationships and called it humility and changed the idea of what it meant to be a truly human, fully human, human being. In 12 Principles of Life, he sets out in this little rule to make four kinds of human relationships the criteria of holiness and a cure for the heart. First, he said, the way we see God will determine how we see all of life as well as the way we live within it. I'm going to ask you today to answer yourself quietly. Who is God for you? Who is your God? What is your God? How do you worship your God, the one you're carrying around? And how do people know who your God is because of the way you act? Secondly, he taught that the way we respond to wisdom figures and authority figures will dictate whether or not we can be seen to grow beyond ourselves alone. Can you learn from anybody else? Do you listen for somebody else's wisdom? Are you giving your own wisdom? Third, he teaches that the way we see ourselves will define our place in the universe, and it will as well affect our impact on it, on your neighborhood, on your small city, on your office, on the hospital, in the system. The way we see ourselves will define our place in the universe and affect our impact on it. And fourth, 
The way we relate to others, he says, will become the measure of our spiritual life and the character of the society in which we live. So the major question this morning is, what did he teach? And what does it mean to thee and me? This morning, today, here, now, when you return to the way we think and live and work. This is not an idle question. This idea of who God is is not an idle question. It will shape everything you are personally. It will shape everything you do professionally. And it will shape every act and attitude that you bring to where you are. So let's look at them. In steps one and two of humility, the rule of Benedict teaches us who God really is. The first step of humility, he says, is to reverence. Now, the old translation said fear because it meant awe. The new translation says to reverence the God whom we call Abba, Father, Daddy, Parent. God, in other words, he is defining as parental love. Who God is for us, then, will shape our lives and the way we deal with other lives. In the first place, notice this. There is no description whatsoever in the rule of Benedict, in all of its chapters and all of its 8,000 words, there is no description whatsoever of God as a slave driver, a warrior, or a cruel tyrant. There is one definition alone of God, and that is Abba, loving parent, lover. Our entire spiritual life, in other words, the way we live and feel and respond to life itself depends on the way you each define God in whose image we say we ourselves are made. For instance, who is your God? Is your God the gotcha God? The one who tells us to be perfect, which is impossible, and then just waits for us to fail and says, gotcha. I knew you'd slip. I took one look at you, and I knew you weren't trying hard. So I just want you to know, since I got you, I can punish you for it. And so in that image, will we punish others for being who they are? Or is your God an unpredictable wonder worker? who demonstrates some kind of irrational, often painful, and pointless power. Why would he do it? Well, to test our loyalty, our faith, as if life itself isn't test enough for you of your loyalty and your faith. And so if you are made in that image, and that's what you expect of God, are we also then telling other people to offer it up, rather than feeling compelled to do something to ease the pain for them? Or are we to think of God as a puppeteer who pulls all the strings of life for us until we want some, some string pulled, like pray I get a wage, oh please God, get, a, get the new house for us, oh, oh God, make sure we don't have as much snow this winter as we did last, my tires won't take it. If we, are, if we are at that point, if God is a puppeteer, then do we ourselves pretend to have power but never use it in behalf of anyone else? Or is our God the God who gives us free will and then condemns us for using it, for making mistakes with it, for having to try over and over again? And so do we ourselves preach to others that pain is pain's good for you? You know, don't, don't worry about pain helps us grow up, as in dancing is bad, drinking is bad, hemorrhoids are good. <laughs> or is our God a magician who does tricks to get our attention? This is the one you know. This is the God who makes red lights turn green. Oh, God, please make that light turn before I get there. I'll be late again. Or do we expect magic to save us too? if we just do enough good religious tricks to get it. But God's like that, who punish for the sake of punishing, who wield power to show they're powerful, who need to be coaxed, bribed in order to be godly, who toys with us for the fun of it. God's like that are ungodly. 
None of that can possibly be godly at all. No, Benedict teaches, this God of love does not give us life to tease us with it, to make it impossible for us. Our God gives us life as it is and then stays with us to support us. And then is Emmanuel, God with me right now. God in front of me, God above me, God behind me, the Irish are fond of saying. And so we grow to fullness through life as it is. In fact, and more, this loving God is also a humble God who began creation, but who did not finish it. Instead, this humble God makes us co-creators with him by giving us the means and the responsibility to complete this creation and sustain it ourselves. And how are we to do that? Through this spirituality of relationships, through your own steps of humility or relationship to the rest of the world that affect everything we do. So let's look at them then and ask ourselves what they're saying to us personally, what they're saying to the world around us. The first step of humility, I repeat, is to reverence this God of love who created us. What is that doing? On the personal level, it's calling us to relinquish our attempt to be our own God knowing that God will give us the energy and the strength that we need when the cancer comes, when the bills can't be paid, when the job is lost, when the institution closes. The energy and the strength we need will be there to wrestle with one dimension of life after another. Then on the public or political level, this first degree of humility is bringing us to understand that we have no right to suppress or demean the fullness of that creation in anyone else. We must support this striving for the fullness of creation with everyone that we touch. But if that's the case, then clearly one of the great tasks of our time is for us to distinguish ourselves between the godly and the ungodly ways that we threaten any life on this planet and do something about it so that we may not only live life well ourselves, but preserve it for others. The second step of humility teaches that we must not love our own will. We must know that God's will for creation is best for us. The point is that this one God wills the same good for all creation for all life, everywhere, as God also wills for us. So then when you say, well, I do accept God's will for creation, that has got to mean consciously that, I, uh, that, God's, that, that accepting this God's will for creation is in essence to promise that I will not be part of obstructing the goods of creation for others in any way, anywhere. On the personal level then, reverence for all of God's creation would surely make racism and sexism impossible. On the political level, the second degree of humility would certainly mean that keeping other people out of the garden of life in order to have the riches of the garden for ourselves requires us to rethink, for instance, what are our real immigration policies? What are our foreign policies? And how are they uplifting or destroying others? And we would surely not be doing anything that would destroy the ecology of creation. We would not be, you and I, playing God with life. We would make national and personal choices that allow the whole world to flourish. If you're asked to recycle, we recycle. If you're told to watch the fertilizers, we get rid of the bad fertilizers. We, we make personal and national choices that allow the whole world to flourish. Surely then, one of the great tasks of this time is to repudiate economic slavery, to see that all workers in our institutions get a living wage, not simply a minimum wage, so that their families too can live a decent life. 
The third step of humility is that we accept the direction of others so that we can learn from the wisdom around us, the wisdom that God has planted in the hearts of everybody else here that I see and know I can learn from. Then we finally come to realize that there are other ways. There are other answers. There are other kinds of plans for the system that are every bit as good as my own, but different. On the personal level, then, we stop scheming to try to get control ourselves. We can trust the world now to other ways and other answers than simply our own. And on the public and political level, at the third degree of humility, even the democratic system itself begins to heal. When pride is no longer permitted to exclude anyone from the system, from the decision making, from the envisioning, the entire system itself, a humble one now, finally becomes an instrument of national unity and world peace. Our task now is to listen in such a way that critics are seen as collaborators rather than enemies and partisanship becomes a thing of the past. We do not withhold ourselves from a common search for the common good. The fourth step of humility teaches that difficult as it may be to accept someone else's authority, that we persist in this process of personal growth, however difficult, and don't give up, not grow weary. Instead, we just keep doing what must be done to make the future possible by refusing to make either the past or the present our God. It builds change into the system and into our relationships and into our respect for others. And as a result, on the personal level, we learn the ways of people who do things in other ways than we would do them, and we discover that the world does not end when it functions differently than I would have made it. On the public level, we would accept direction from those who experience life other than we do. On the public level, we would be listening to the United Nations, for instance, before we devastated Muslim communities because we do not understand their religious values. Clearly, the task for this time is for us in our small places, in our, our families, in our neighborhoods, to learn to accept fresh new ways to be alive. Now, clearly, the overarching task of those first four degrees of humility concentrate on awareness of God, trust in the will of God for creation, acceptance of the wisdom of, of others, and gives us the persistence in difficult circumstances to forego our own arrogance and omnipotence. Or to put it another way, once we know that there is only one God and we are not it, and that others are also carriers of God's will to us, the stress that comes from fear of failure and our struggle to control our life, control the office, control the ward, control the system, gives way to God is within us, and all will be well. Then steps five to eight of this development of right relationships through humility. Here's the tough part, grab your chairs. It brings us face to face with ourselves. Now the rubber hits the road. Here we are called to know ourselves. Now we must get truthful with ourselves about our weaknesses, about our gnawing desires, about our inner grasp for superiority. The fifth step of humility teaches us to open ourselves to a spiritual guide, a best friend, a holy person, about our own death-dealing struggles for status and station. It's calling us to realize that to be self-critical is absolutely essential to growth and happiness. This sixth century document knew what psychology uh, uh, 15 centuries later finally confirmed, and you know it in a healing profession, 
Self-disclosure always leads to growth. It separates us from our false images. It takes the burden off of our backs to be what we are not. It drains away the hypocrisies within us. It ends all of our puny little charades while we're making sure that the neighbors across the street see the new car and therefore feel that we are far more important or wealthy than they know us to be. It frees our real self to grow. On the personal level then, the fifth step of humility calls us to reveal the demons that have mastered us. The shame, maybe. The addictions, maybe. The jealousies, maybe. The pretenses, maybe. So that our souls are freed and we may return to the world around us a gentler, kinder, more understanding person. As we understand and reveal ourselves, we grow in understanding and, uh, of others and we put down the criticism of some comes so quickly to our lips. Women who spoke out, who unveiled the wholesale sexual harassment and abuse culture, for instance, foreswore to their eternal credit their own public image for the welfare of other women. That is personal humility at work. Those who swallow a stone become a stone, the proverb says, and that's true. But it's humility that frees us from the egoism that rolls the stone of hypocrisy away. Indeed, on the public level, the fifth degree of humility, self-exposure, self-revelation, saves me from the public burden of perfection because I have now admitted to myself at least, and to someone else that I'm not. The struggles we hide, in other words, are the struggles that are consuming our energies. The struggles we hide are the struggles that are making us sick. They are holding us captive to our secrets. They are sickening our hearts. But who or what can diminish us once we've admitted them ourselves? No, I'm not from a wealthy family. Yes, my father was in jail. Yes, I gave up a child. Yes, I was arrested for forgery. Yes, I lied and destroyed another's life. Yes to it all. Because then the private wars for status ends and self-righteousness dies. As our sister Mary Lou Kanaki writes, who is it that we would not love if we only knew their stories? Who is it? that we would not love if we only knew their stories. So our great task now is rooted in ourselves. In it, it's an exercise in honest self-appraisal, in the awareness that perfection is not perfect, and in the joy and freedom that comes with allowing ourselves to be fallible again. The sixth step of humility saves us from all the disappointments in life. It says we are content with the lowest and most menial of treatment. We are content with the lowest and most menial of treatment. We are called, in other words, now not to accept humiliations. Humiliations have nothing to do with humility. We're called to accept the natural circumstances of life without the self-aggrandizement, the exaltation of the self to live simply, to put on no airs, to have no expectations of preference, to simply be me, to get up and come over here my real unadorned self. Then on the personal level, if I never expect special treatment, I can never be insulted again when the invitation does not come that I was expecting, when I'm not elected committee chair, when I have to stand in line for tickets just like everybody else, when there is no reserved seat for me at dinner, I will not be crushed to be overlooked. I will not feel ashamed of who I am not, and I will not call it poor treatment. Why? Because I am freed now 
from the pain of presumption. On the public level, too, the sixth degree of humility reminds us not to live on the assumption of special attention or special protection in face of dangers faced even by the smallest nations and their concerns. Small countries in the Pacific, for instance, who are concerned about losing their islands to the global warming that we are denying. Or Puerto Rico, perhaps, and its plaintive cries for disaster that we, we never sent, for disaster aid, I'm sorry, that we never sent have as much right to be heard and helped despite their smaller size as we do with our more miles of floodlands. The important task of this time is for all of us to care for the least of these, to value and recognize, to embrace the needs of the weak everywhere as well as the prominent. In the seventh step of humility, it says we will not only admit with our tongues, but we're also convinced in our hearts that I myself am not superior to anybody. In fact, in some way, I'm inferior to everybody. On the personal level, I know that wherever I am, there is someone in every chair in this room who is wiser, smarter, kinder, more talented, more whatever than I am or you are. I know that I have gifts, but I'm not universally superior to anyone, let alone to everyone. On the public level, then, it tells us there's always something we can learn as a people from others. And it is then that the cultural boundaries disappear. Then our work in a global world is to make connections, real connections with those most unlike us. And we begin to know now about at the seventh degree of humility that there's no justification for narcissism anywhere. In the eighth step of humility, the rule says, do what is endorsed by our community as examples of good living. We're called to participate in community building, in maintaining this great system, in seeing what its best is, is making sure that the best is not getting wiped out of your jobs and your cares. And when you come in in the morning, that you are coming into a system that you are building that everybody knows about and everybody says has a humanity inside those doors that they've never seen. We respect all experience. We honor all traditions and cultures. And so self-worship, which is the beginning of cruelty to others, ends. And so on the public level, narcissism dies a natural death. And the eighth degree of humility challenges us to explain to ourselves then how, in the light of national tradition, which we say we honor, national tradition, national experience, and community ideals, you tell me how we are still calling ourselves Americans while we ignore our history of accepting strangers and the greatest number of arrests in the United States today are of illegal immigrants who haven't committed a felony and over a 1,000 immigrant children are still crying for their missing mothers at night. Our task in this time is to remember and require that no one be considered above and no one be exempted from honoring the common good. And at that point, the stress that comes from our image keeping, our social posturing, our ravaging ambition, and maintaining our masks in public drops away. It's all gone. And we're free to be ourselves. Finally, in steps 9 to 12 of the tools of humility in our relationships with everyone, we discover that in the ninth degree of humility, we learn to keep silent so others can be heard. In the tenth degree of humility, we learn not to laugh at or ridicule anybody around us. In the 11th degree of humility, we learn that nothing that hurts or demeans another, like nicknames that insult a person, is funny. We learn that racism and sexism are not humor. They're just cheap ways of making myself look good by making others look bad. We learn to be kind to those who are also like us, just wrestling with the dregs of life. Without a doubt, the great task in this time is to demand civil discourse, and to require character 
as a quality of leadership, to raise the children of the next generation to respect every human being, however unlike themselves. We must refuse the lewd, crude, rude, and caustic language that is demeaning and diminishing people everywhere, that is labeling and belittling their humanity, and is too fast becoming the norm of discussion in our society. And finally, the 12th degree of humility tells us to be calm, to be contained in our bearings as well as in our hearts, not in order to be politically correct, but in order to become emotionally adult and spiritually mature. Then comes in this little tiny rule, the only guarantee, the only promise that is made in the entire text. And at the end of the chapter in humility, Benedict says, and if you do these things, if you do these things, you will achieve the love of God that casts out fear of anything, the love that completes the union with God to which we are all called and our eternal peace starts here and we are stress-free. If the 12 steps of humility had been written today, in fact, you know, I, I, nobody ever asked me to rewrite them, but I'm sure if Benedict were alive, he would have. So I did. <laughs> if the 12 degrees of humility had been written today, I think they would have sounded very much like this. To be humble means to, one, recognize that only God is God, not me. Two, know that God wills the same good for everyone. Help them get it. Three, Seek out and learn from wisdom figures. Four, endure the pains of development, of conversion, and don't give up. Five, acknowledge your faults and remove those masks. Tear away this hiding we do, trying to tell people that we're different, better, wiser, stronger, than, than they are. Six, be content with less than the best. Seven, let go a false sense of superiority. None of us are. Eight, preserve tradition and learn from the community. Nine, listen to others. Ten, refuse to ridicule anyone or anything. Eleven, speak kindly. And finally, twelve, stay calm so that the God who is with you can be seen in you. Then you will have melted into the heart of God. You will be full of life. You will be simple in your needs. You will be free of wants. And you will be serene of heart. You will be transformed and transforming. You will cure, heal, enliven the people and the country of your own little world around you. And yes, civilization will be saved again. Why? Because as you all know better than most groups I see, the soul always pours over into the physical. Remember too, that if awareness is, if narcissism is awareness of self, humility is awareness of God. If narcissism is scornful, Humility is respectful of all. If narcissism is disdainful of others, humility listens to everyone. If narcissism rests on fixed and static ideas, humility is always open to growth. If narcissism is them and me, humility is we and us. If narcissism tears the world apart as it is doing in our age and in our nation, sixth century Rome, and the rule of Benedict is proof that humility can, has, and will put it together again. Then, as the Sufi teaches, we will carry our light within us. Then, as Abba Zosimus knew, our passion for life will free us to become the fullness of ourselves. And then, as Joseph Conrad writes, we will have learned how to live. But remember, too, dear friends, 
that time changes nothing. People do. There's no use sitting there saying, yeah, I, th I, I heard a lot of truth there. Yeah, I think that's right. Eventually it will come. No, it won't. Time changes nothing. People do. You change one thing, and this country will change. Because you see, you are the missing element in the accomplishment of all these things. Without you as Toffler Worms, if we do not shape the future, we shall be compelled to endure it. But you must also know that if the people will lead, eventually the leaders will follow. Dear friends, for the sake of the children, for the sake of the church, for the sake of this civilization, for God's sake, lead us somewhere worthwhile. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Sister Joan, thank you so very much for sharing this extremely important message rooted in the rule of St. Benedict and his teachings on humility. What a great way to start off our conference. Now, we do have a gift for you. Wow, good. I accept. <laughs> Last year, uh, we were blessed to be able to celebrate with the sisters their 125th anniversary. And part of that celebration, we had the St. John's Bible that made its way to all of our communities. Uh, and so there were thousands of people that were exposed to the St. John's Bible that might not have otherwise that have been able to see that. So we have for you a print of one of the, uh, some of the artwork that's, oh God, that was in the St. John's Bible. Now, we know that you travel a lot, so don't feel you have to put this in your suitcase. We can mail this uh, no, to you. No, I will put it in my okay. suitcase. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, know, I know how busy offices are, uh, you know. <laughs> Jeez, where'd this come from? Where are we, what are we supposed to do with this thing? Thank you. So. This is nice. <laughs> You know, how, how do you follow that up, right? <laughs> uh, so once again, Sister Joan, thank you so very much uh, for your time and for, your, and for visiting with us today.